Lucy's here, we can start. Uh, well, before we get started this evening, I just want to mention a couple of uh, uh, upcoming events. On February, Friday, February 12th, at Northeastern University, and there are flyers pertaining to this out on the table in the uh, entryway, uh, Nasser and the Northeastern Armenian Students Association will be presenting a panel discussion at Northeastern University uh, on Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, past, present, and future. And the moderator of that discussion, Dr. Anna Ohanyan, is here with us tonight. Anna, please, please wave. And uh, Professor Payaslian of uh, Boston University will be giving a historical introduction, and we will have four uh, panelists of diverse backgrounds uh, discussing various aspects of, of Nagorno-Karabakh, as the title says, past, present, and future. So we very much hope you will enjoy, uh, we, that you will come there and enjoy the discussion. And this is the, will be the third in an ongoing series that we started really, I guess, a little over a year ago, uh, taking place on university campuses and focusing on contemporary issues and featuring panelists drawn from what we like to call the younger generation. <laughs> so please mark your calendars. Now, my important task right now, good evening, hello, is uh, in, in to take the place of our chairman, Rafi Agayan, who cannot be here with us tonight. And it is my solemn and yet joyous duty to introduce to you uh, a new member of the Nasser staff and family. Uh, as some of you may know, Nasser, in its 60 years of existence, has never had an executive director. People sometimes think, Mark's the executive director. <laughs> Not so, my friends. Not so. We've never had an executive director. Uh, we do now. We have a wonderful, talented executive director, uh, whom some of you know, and who will now say a few words to us. Sarah Ignatius. Sarah. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. Um, I'm thrilled to be the executive director here. Uh, obviously, as all of you know, uh, because of how incredible NASA is as a national organization and all the work that's been going on for the last 60 years, but also on a very personal level. Um, my grandfather, uh, <clears throat> Josep Ignatius, was active in the Armenian community in the Los Angeles area. And so, as we all know, um, Manuk was meticulous in keeping records. So my first day at work, I went to the uh, correspondence archives, not to be confused with a lot of our other archives, and I went to the eye drawer and I pulled out a file and sure enough found correspondence between Manuk, uh, he has the carbon copy of them, and my grandfather, and my grandfather writing in his cursive indecipherable oh, well, script, well, well. <laughs> donating, um, donating to Nasser. So I'm sure my grandfather, it never dawned on him uh, that one of his granddaughters might be working at Nasser one day in Manug's own office. Oh. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I know he'd be very proud, and I have a copy of one of his letters framed on my desk. So I really feel I'm coming home, and even though I only started in January, uh, I just feel I've been, well, I've been on the board and been involved with NASA for years. But I, re I really feel like this is exactly where I'm meant to be. So thank you very much um, for supporting NASA, and Hope you enjoy the program tonight, and if you do, I'm sure you will, and you're not a member, I just really urge you to join NASA so we can continue to do this type of programming. And I feel like an incredible thing that NASA offers is just this, connecting scholars with 
people in the community, connecting members of the community with each other, and connecting all of us with our Armenian heritage. So thanks a lot, and I look forward to speaking with you um, tonight and in the future, and hope to see you all again. Thank you. Uh, I want to acknowledge and thank also our co-sponsor of tonight's program, the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University. Nasser has established a close and highly productive working relationship with the Strassler Center, having co-organized and co-sponsored three major conferences as well as other notable programs over the past several years. It is a noteworthy week for the Strassler Center and for the Kalustian Mugar Chair in Modern Armenian History and Genocide Studies, held by Tanner Akjam, not present. Because tomorrow, they will be marking the minting of one new doctor, Khachi Muradyan, and the reaching of a milestone for another doctor in progress, Asya Darbinian, who is present here tonight. Asya, would you please rise in the acknowledgement of water? I'm proud also that Nasser has supported the research of each of these scholars, as well as another student of Tanar Akjams, Dr. Tobi Umit Kurt. The work of a new generation of scholars must be supported, and we firmly believe that by doing so, we are making a difference and an impact that will be felt for a long time. It's no coincidence that our speaker tonight, Professor Keith David Wattenpah, happens to be here tonight since he is on Asya Darbinian's advisory committee at Clark. And it's a great pleasure to welcome him back to Nasser, where he first spoke in late 2010, uh, further ago, longer ago than either he or I realized or would like to admit. And at that time, he spoke about his then work in progress, which as of last year, is the published book, Bread from Stones, The Middle East and the Making of Modern Humanitarianism, issued by the University of California Press. This book is a major contribution to our understanding of both the exceedingly difficult process of providing relief and rescue for many thousands, if not millions, of Armenian women and other refugees, trafficked women and children, and other victims of genocide and displacement, as well as the complex legacy of these efforts. Also, within the past year, Keith was instrumental in the publication of and wrote the uh, foreword and afterward to, or the introduction and afterward to, the memoir Goodbye Antura, a memoir of the Ar Armenian Genocide by Karni Panyan. And uh, many of you I know were at the event uh, at the Armenian Museum last fall with uh, Huri Boyamyan, who's here somewhere tonight. Hi, Huri. Uh, and Keith took part in that program long distance via video. But this evening, we actually have the real Keith David Watton. And lastly, I would like to say that not only has Keith made great contributions through his research and scholarship, but he has also been and continues to be one of the most staunch voices against denial of the Armenian Genocide. Like all who take the stand, it is a sacrifice of significant time and energy, and it deserves to be recognized and appreciated. So please join with me in welcoming Professor Keith Wattenbaugh. So, um, Nasser is a place that I always feel like I'm coming home to. Uh, lots of familiar and friendly faces from my, my past and my present are here. And uh, yes, about... Six years ago, my kids were, were three. Um, we came to, to Boston to see friends, and I, I, I gave a talk. And uh, it was a very important moment for me. I was talking about the publication of an American Historical Review article, the very first one on the Armenian Genocide in that 150-year-old journal of record for the, uh, the international English-speaking historical community. And that was really a... a the beginning of the kinds of questions I was beginning to ask in, in my book. Now I want to make sure I can pull this up. The other thing I always say when I come to Nasser is that this is the one place in the world I'm better known as the son-in-law of Sona Zetlian. 
All right? So I have to, I just sent her, I just sent her a Facebook message saying I was going to have to say that. So, Mark, this is only coming up part of the... Yeah, yeah. Let me well, just, well, why do you suppose again. that is? Well, let me just try again. Let's see what happens. We are, are all, us humanists are always devastated by our technology. Okay. It was fine before. It was fine before. And then we started knocking. Is there anything covering it? No. Armenian, so we've, we've said hello to Pada to Sona, all the way out in Los Angeles uh, on your behalf. So, Armenian lives are lives of journey. This is something I've, I've, I've noticed. I'm, you know, I'm married to a woman who is from a family that have been made refugees just about every generation, going back to their, their village life in, in Musada. And that journeying, I think, is, is something that really attracted me to under, trying to understand the Armenian experience. And my, I was trained as a, as a Middle East historian, very traditional kind of Middle Eastern historian at UCLA. And when I first started my work, I had been interested in working on Armenian yeah. topics and thinking about the genocide and so on. But in those days at UCLA, we were warned against that. We were told, if you go down that path, you'll work with Hovhannisian and you'll never get a job. You'll never get a grant. And so I took that very seriously as a young graduate student might, and I wrote about Arab nationalism and the middle class and so on. But the city that I decided to write about was the city of Aleppo. And I'd lived in Damascus for a year when I was perfecting my Arabic, and it was a marvelous city to live in. But we would escape to Aleppo for the weekends, and we had a great time. Aleppo was different. It had a different feel in those days. It was a town much more open to commerce. And it had this wonderfully unique characteristic. It had these Armenian neighborhoods, where you'd look up on the signs and you'd see Armenian script rather than just Arabic. You would uh, smell you know, forbidden smells like Arak when you were walking along the streets of, of, of the town. And it was a different place. And I knew that this was a city I wanted to write about. And so in the mid-1990s, I returned to the city of Aleppo to work on my doctoral dissertation. Just to prove I was there, here's a photograph of me. Um, and you know, I look at this photograph and I have nice brown chestnut hair and no gray in my beard. Um, but this is also a very bittersweet photograph for me. This was Hignar, my wife is an Islamic art historian who's right now finishing a book on the Zaytun Gospels. And this is a rooftop in the old city of Aleppo, sort of looking towards the, the Grand Umayyad Mosque, the minaret of the Grand Umayyad Mosque, which dates originally from about the 9th century. Well, that's gone. It was blown up in the, during the Civil War in Aleppo. But it was 1995, and Hedlar and I decided, a little bit later in the spring, we go out to the Armenian cemetery that's on the outskirts of town. And, uh, the, you know, the scouts are having a little uh, gathering there, middle of April, you know, for, for April 24th. And, and we're walking around, and we come across this grave. And it was for a woman by the name of Karan Yepbe, or Yepbe. Jetbe, right? And it's and it's said in Danish, Armenian mother, mother of Armenians. Like, who, who is this person? Right? That's a, always a good historian, right? When you walk around and see something you don't quite understand, you think, who, who is this? And that was the that was the first step in a journey that began to force me to ask some questions about Aleppo and about survivor communities, the relationship of survivor communities to indigenous communities, the people who are already there and towards eventually to uh, uh, studying the rescue movement, the, the gathering of the orphans and others in the period after the First World War, and the significant role that was played by Karin Yepe and other foreign humanitarians in that work. What also drew me to this was, you know, the fact that I was married to someone, as I said before, who was descended from refugees. And the more time I spent with my wife talking to her, which is, you know, a pleasant thing to do usually, is learning more and more about the Musada Armenians. And learning about the, the, uh, the 40 days and the rescue. And, 
And my interest began to become, very, I became very interested in them as refugees, especially because they were organized into what many of us think was the very first modern refugee camp here located in Port Said. And this is a photo that my friend Jeff helped me find from the Harvard Library. This is a really interesting photograph to me. You see the tents are lined up in straight lines. And the refugee men are being marched out of the camp under guard, not because they did anything wrong, but because they're being taken to factories where they're going to work to help pay for their, um, their presence in Egypt. Uh, the, the, it was surrounded by barbed wire, um, entrance and egress from the camp was monitored, people had identification. There's a beautiful map of the, of the camp, an archival map of the camp that tells us which families lived in which tents, in fact. And so I was, I was intrigued by this, this as well. And so that process of understanding the Musada Armenians and, and their survival after the war, of living in Aleppo, a place with this giant Armenian community, all these issues began to coalesce in my mind as important questions. I'm opposed to PowerPoint, but maybe I should have done that. Because of that, that issue um, of Karniepe, of survivors, and so on, I followed the trail then of these questions to the League of Nations Archive in Geneva, where I'd heard about the Aleppo, the registry of the Aleppo Rescue Home. And I talked about this last time I was here. It was a long time ago, maybe you forgot. So I'll tell you more about it right now. But of course, Aleppo was there in the, the northern part of Syria, and much of many of the women who had been trafficked during the genocide, you knew these stories, right, where the caravans were moved through the desert, they would be attacked by Bedouin or Kurds or others, women would be taken from the caravans, or they'd be sold by their escorts into various forms of slavery, enslavement. Um, and what happened after the war is that with the Allied occupation, the creation of the, of the Faisal's Arab Kingdom, uh, Armenian groups and others would go out and rescue or facilitate the rescue or the retransfer of women back to the Armenian community. But one thing I discovered, and something that, you know, on this journey that, that became very important to me, was when you read the stories, like the story of Zabel, the daughter of Bedros from Arapkir, is that it wasn't so much that Western humanitarians and others were going out and rescuing them, the trafficked women, the refugees themselves, were beginning to exert agency over their own lives. And in this case, she rescued herself. She heard about uh, that her family might have been living in Aleppo from an Armenian uh, model, model tea driver who was out in the northern desert near Kobani, which is now a city very much in the news. Um, and Ras al Ain, and she made her way to Aleppo, and we know about this through her, through a, a story told about her in the third person, uh, where she was given a haircut and put in a modern modern outfit, and they located a living sibling, and she was reunited with him. But it was these stories like this, and I've written elsewhere about how these kinds of stories, and when you when you read enough of them, they begin to really tear at you. Brought up another issue that I wanted to think about. In, in this story of humanitarianism. So these things start to, we're starting to fall together. And the question that, I, that, that emerged from these archives, and you know, one more archive that I, I was very interested in as well, the archive of Near East Relief and of the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, was what was the role of the international response to the Armenian genocide in the creation of what we now call modern humanitarianism? And humanitarianism is, is defined in many ways, but, but one of the best definitions of humanitarianism is organized compassion. Why are people moved by the suffering of strangers half a world away to organize themselves through governments, through non-governmental organizations? Why are they willing to spend millions of dollars to help people they've never met and do things like this. And that led me finally to wanting to tell the story in part of Near East Relief. 
Now, many of you know about Near East Relief. This is one of the things that, that Armenians point to with a great deal of pride. Uh, the current head of the Near East Foundation, which is the successor to Near East Relief, is a man by the name of Shant Matharosian, who is Armenian. That Near East Relief was an organization that was founded during the First World War, primarily to address the suffering of Armenians in the Near East. And so I wanted to understand why they did that. It wasn't just that the Armenian, you know, this was the First World War. There was a great deal of suffering occurring in the world at that time. The United States wasn't even at war in the Ottoman Empire. Why would they be interested in this, in doing this, in, in doing something for these people half a world away? And so the focus of my research, I mean, on, on all these various issues, the focus of my research then began to turn to one man, a man whose life I was very familiar with because of another starting point or a point on this, this journey of this book. And that's Stanley Kerr, who's seen here, dressed in a Near East Relief uniform. And Near East Relief was organized during the war and then did most of its work after the war um, in something that's very interesting and wouldn't necessarily be done today by modern or contemporary humanitarians. They would, the men would dress in sort of these modified World War I uniforms. And then women always had this, women volunteers, often dressed in these sort of white outfits uh, to distinguish themselves. And this is a, an image of Kerr at a picnic, of all things, right, in the city of Ainta, or excuse me, Marash, excuse me, Marash, sometime in 1920. And, you know, we, we, he's surrounded mostly by his bodyguards, which tells you something about Marash at that moment in history. And they're having, <coughs> looks like uh, walnuts or dates down here, some other fruits and vegetables, a couple bottles of something. Um, and then tins that were filled with, with food. And there's a couple smiles, but not a lot. And so I was wondering why, why Kerr was interested in going. I was also interested in Kerr because I was very good friends with Ann Kerr. And she had been someone who was part of our lives at UCLA for many years, um, after her husband Malcolm Kerr had been murdered at AUB. She had come back to UCLA where they had lived uh, much of their lives to work. He's more famous now where I teach as being the grandfather, Stanley, as being the grandfather of Steve Kerr, who's the coach of the Golden State Warriors. <laughs> not kidding, not kidding at all. Um, was, why, why would you do this? Why would you travel across the world to help people out? And so I never, I, so those are some of the questions that I wanted to try to answer. And so I thought I'd move now to read a couple passages from my book to you that, that try to explore why Kerr did what he did. And then also read a couple passages, or one passage, exploring the impact of those actions on Armenian orphan lives. So not only will we look at, well, will I read to you a passage that sort of tries my best to account for why someone would care, but then understanding how that caring did something for Arme the Armenian community and the Armenian survivors of the genocide. Let me get my copy of the book. And then I have to put on my old man reading glasses. Goodness. They look very good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So this is from a part of my book called uh, America's Wards which uh, examines Near East Relief's relationship with the Armenian community um, in the period after the First World War. And part of the argument I make is that American Near East Relief viewed the Armenians as a kind of vanguard for a new Near East. In fact, it wasn't just about helping Armenian suffering, it was also about trying to, to bring to the Middle East, some might say impose on the Middle East, a, an American vision of modernity. And the Armenians were going to be the vanguard for this. They were going to be at the very forefront. Because the community had been so devastated, the American relief mission saw itself as being able to shape it and form it in a certain way. Now, this wasn't universally well received by the Armenians, especially the Armenian church, and it certainly wasn't even unanimous amongst the relief workers who worked in the field. And, you know, I think it's contemporary relief workers would agree with the 
the statement that what happens in New York or Washington, D.C. about directing policy sometimes fails when it gets out into the, to the reality of the field. So, come back. Come back. No. <laughs> okay. So Kerr came to the humanitarian enterprise um, through a very unique way. At the time he joined Near East Relief, he had been working in the medicinal chemistry laboratory of Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C., and was facing demobilization with few job prospects and little money for his avowed goal, an advanced degree in organic chemistry. His decision to go to the Middle East was based not on any prior knowledge of the region and was instead simply a spontaneous choice made at the prompting of a superior officer at the medical center. Kerr, Kerr's, Kerr's introduction to the region occurred en route to the Eastern Mediterranean on board the SS Leviathan, a luxury liner that had been converted to a troop transport ship during the war. Aboard ship, Kerr, alongside 250 new Near East recruits, including former U.S. Army nurses and doctors, received an abbreviated education on what had happened to the Armenians during the war itself, both from returning missionaries and what were becoming the Near East Relief's canonical texts, Toynbee's Blue Book, Blue Book Ambassador Morgenthau's story, and Clarence Usher's 1917, An American Physician in Turkey. Arriving in Istanbul, then under joint Allied occupation, Kerr was assigned to Aleppo in May of 1919 in the post-war Arab Syrian Kingdom. That city, alongside Beirut, was the major collection point for Armenian refugees. As the initial post-war plan to restore the Armenians to south-central Anatolia took shape, Aleppo became the hub for relief work activities. Kerr's letters home in this early period tell the story of a young man enjoying the novelty of Aleppo in southern Anatolia, from describing the sounds of Arab weddings and the thrill of boar hunting and his collection of handicrafts, to asking his parents to send money for a planned trip, floating, floating down the Tigris on a raft at the end of his contract in the spring of 1920, sort of like a junior year abroad student writing home. In these early letters, Kerr voiced a great confidence and optimism in the Near East Relief Project. That enthusiasm was shared by the Near East Relief leadership, which believed that the American Relief Agency would have a largely unfettered role in setting up hospitals and implementing refugee resettlement. Kerr perceived his job as not just immediate relief, but also an act of what today would be called restorative justice for the Armenians. The key program was the repatriation of Armenians to their homelands under the auspices of a European protectorate. However, Across the summer and fall of 1919, Kerr began to encounter elements of the humanitarian crisis and larger political context that did not fit neatly into that program. Those elements forced him to begin to question the feasibility and, at times, even the justice of Near East Relief's overall strategy. The first was Kerr's introduction to the complex problem posed by the massive transfer of Armenian children from their families into Turkish and Bedouin households in Syria. In some cases, these children were placed in state orphanages, where they were converted to Islam. Authorities also distributed children to Muslim families as foster children. Still others were stolen from the deportation caravans and sold or traded en route. Kerr and Near East Relief officials in Aleppo, with the official support of the Arab Kingdom, had begun to cooperate with Armenian organizations to recover these children in areas under Allied occupation. In one instance, Kerr traveled to the nearby city of Bab, which is now under Daesh occupation, to recover Armenian children, primarily adolescent girls, who had been integrated into Arab households. He recalled meeting with a sheikh who had several children in his household he claimed to have taken from the homes of their murdered parents in Ainta in the spring of 1915. The sheikh told Kerr that he had treated them as his own children, and Kerr believed that the children loved the man as a father based on his brief visit. Quote, Now are you going to take these children from me after I've protected them during the past four years? He remembered the shit asking him. Kerr claimed, quote, If I could have foreseen the future for the Armenians of Ainta, 
who faced incredible violence the, that, that year. I would have de decided immediately to leave these children where they were loved, but I had been commissioned to get them and allowed my sense of duty to override sentiment. Quote, I have no choice, I said to the sheikh. The Emir Faisal had ordered that they should return to their own community. I must take them to Aleppo. Kerr was clearly moved by the condition of the children, who also objected to being taken to the city to rejoin their community. For Kerr, the pragmatic reality that the children appeared safe and cared for outweighed his sense, perhaps in retrospect, that the reconstitution of the Armenian community was the overriding cause. At the most basic level, he was caught between the problem of the individual humanity of the children and the problem for humanity that Near East Relief had arrogated to itself to solve. The conditions that Kerr witnessed near Bab were far from unique, and among present-day Armenians, there's even a sense of gratitude to the Bedouin for taking in so many vulnerable <coughs> children. However, as children were brought into rescue homes, as children were brought into rescue homes established by Near East Relief, where they were processed, including being photographed, they also were asked to explain what had happened to them in the years between the onset of the genocide and their rescue. While the records from the Near East Relief Administered Rescue Home are lost, many of the reports from the years when it was under the control of the League of Nations, like the one I showed you, uh, remain a useful source for understanding that the children face conditions of slavery, and for the girls, serial rape and forced marriage. In November 1919, Kerr wrote to his family detailing the laborious work of photographing orphan children at the Near East Relief Facility in Ainta. Similar to the work of the rescue home, where photographs and personal data were put to use trying to find living relatives or rescued children, the Near East Relief hoped to reunite families and raise funds. Kerr writes, At Aintep, he's writing to his family, At Aintep, I photographed 960 orphans and had a record made of each child's name, its parents' names, and a story of each one's experiences during the war. These will be copied and the copies with photos sent to America with an appeal for individuals to support or, quote unquote, adopt orphans. It was lots of fun doing this work, as all the kids like to be photoed. At Marash, I'm to do the same thing, unquote. By the time he had completed the work at Marash, Kerr had photographed and transcribed, with the help of a translator, the stories of nearly 2,000 children. In a letter to his father in mid-December 1919, he writes, quote, The stories these little kids can tell about their experiences are awfully interesting, the way they are told. Picking at one at random from his desk, he recounts the rough translation of the story of Vartanush Seferian, a 17-year-old orphan housed at the Near East Release Orphanage in Marash. Quote, Our family was composed of 11 members. My brother, in America, was married, and his wife was with us with her two sons. My three sisters and one brother at home were married, so they all started with us. First, we were exiled to a place called Hassan Oulu for four months. There, Turks made a massacre. They took our properties. We fled back to Kemash. At the war, at the war, Turk women killed with axes, my father and mother, and also my uncles. When we reached Kemash, Turks threw into river my nephews. An officer took one of my brother's wife, so I fled to Kemash back. There, the Kaimakam of Kemash took me and I was a servant in his family as many as four years. When Russian army came, so many Armenian widows fled to them. It was announced that none of the Turks would keep Armenians in his house, so Kaim Khan sent me away, and I came to Marash with a Muslim. At the same time, my brother's wife fled to Russian army. After two days of my arrival to Marash, I was put by the aid of Armenians to rescue home. There I lived nearly eight months, but now I am in Near East Relief Orphanage." Unquote. It is perhaps evidence of the increasing difficult psychological toll that hearing those stories was having on Kerr that, despite promising to tell his family more of them, he never did. Still, in his memoir of four decades later, he recalled, "...the Gravlex camera was entrusted to me for this project, together with an ample supply of film, developer, and photographic paper." 
And I set out for Eintep on this pleasant mission. Thank you. On this pleasant mission. There I photographed the children in small groups and obtained information for a history sheet for each child. The stories told by the older children seemed so fantastic that at first I found them unbelievable. But one by one, they corroborated each other. They had seen violence and death while small and accepted it much as children today accepted on the television screen. It was happening to someone else. It is critical to recognize what a powerful cumulative effect those stories, testimonies, must have had on Kerr at the time. The horror of the massacres and deportations that occurred during the war were no longer mediated for him through the writings of diplomats or news accounts. Now Kerr himself was using the technology of photography and the bureaucratic tools of the report to produce humanitarian knowledge of the broader catastrophe. He was putting faces and names to trauma and its lasting impact on the bodies and minds of young people. And while he witnessed a dissociation by the orphans from their own experience, it was happening to someone else. He was now associating that traumatic experience with real children, and probably having a difficult time understanding the profound emotional reaction he himself felt at the juxtaposition of the children and their experience in that moment. It was a collection of emotions, including anger and empathy, that may have only begun to make sense to him as he remembered it toward the end of his life, and only then after he had had children of his own. Certainly the time Kerr spent with the orphans was key to his later decision to remain in Madash during the worst moments of the massacres, and after the abandonment of the city by French colonial forces, when he too could have left the city. While his sense of professional responsibility is enough to explain that decision, I would argue that his personal encounter with the suffering of children in particular made their protection a problem for Kerr's own humanity. His letters home from this period change abruptly in tone from that of a callow tourist to the considered and measured response of a caring professional who understood at once the depth of need as well as the sources of suffering. Tales of hunting boars ceased. One of the ideas I have in this book is that what drives people to help, to care, is that they feel as though they risk losing what makes them human if they don't. Right? And this, this goes doubly true for a professional like Kerr, who understood his capability to help and felt an additional responsibility because of the knowledge of that ability. Still, this is, this is often very difficult to explain. And I've, I've written this whole book about this. I continue to think and write about why humanitarians act. I reflect on when I go out into the field like I've done with my colleague Adrian over the last three years to try to work with Syrian refugee university students, I still don't understand why this happens. I'm very thankful that it does. I think we'd be a worse off place if it didn't. But I, I've never felt that I can competently explain precisely why. So I'm just suggesting some reasons. I thought I'd conclude by reading, um, I think, my favorite passage in this book. A uh, passage as I was writing it, in fact, I remember that sometimes tears would come to my eyes as I would as I would do it. Um, you know, I too have kids, and I think about them and, and their origins and so on. Um, and it's an attempt to make sense of what Near East Relief's efforts towards Armenian orphans accomplished. What, what happened to these young people who were in Near East Relief orphanages, who were exposed to these American policies and, and so on. Many of you in this room may in fact be descendant of people. I know some of you are in fact, descendant of people who spent time in these orphanages and may or may not have attributed their survival to that time. So I thought I'd read a section from my book at the end of this chapter of American War. It's called Orphan Lives. I thought it was important to... Yeah. So much writing about the Middle East now is, is so written from the center. It's written from European archives. It's, it's written about her conquest and conquerors that we never really, we've, we've stopped being able to see the, and let the voices come from those to whom these humanitarian policies and actions uh, took place. That's why I'm so thankful, for example, we now have Karni Panian's memoir in English. So, Near East Relief had gone to the Eastern Mediterranean to make Armenians the vanguard of a new 
modern, and moral community. With the collapse of the humanitarian project in Cilicia, now of course this is when Near East Relief had sought to move people back into Cilicia, the French withdrawal, the, um, the rise of Turkish nationalism, and, and Kemalism ended that project. Where the organization had sought social transformation within the context of French colonial nation building, it faced in the refugee camps in the cities of the region instead the problem of survival. Nevertheless, as the organization rebuilt its infrastructure in the Levant, elements of that transformation, transformative project were reintegrated and adapted into orphan care. Evidence of the organization's clear break with its missionary past is seen likewise in its 1921 decision to cooperate with the Armenian Orthodox Church hierarchy, a decision that would have been anathema a generation earlier among the American Protestant missionaries in the region. <coughs> The information from the field, including reports telling of increasing cooperation with diaspora civil society institutions created by Armenians, is indicative of the formation of partnerships that were not foreseen by the more paternalistic leadership of the organization in New York and anticipate a more contemporary collaborative practice between the objects and subjects of humanitarianism. These partnerships provided Near East relief with personnel, funds, and local knowledge that made what work the organization was able to do somewhat more effective through the mid-1920s. That final transition is visible in three of the few surviving memoirs of orphans who passed through Near East Relief institutions. Karni Panian, Asht Rik Aivakian, and her book Stranger Among Friends, and of course Antranik Zaruchian's Men Without Childhoods. On the one hand, all the memoirs, actually what's very interesting is very few people know that there was a woman memoirist at, from AUH Hospital. Everyone knows about Zoruchian, but not about Ivakian. Yeah. On the one hand, all the memoirs illustrate the potential social mobility offered by the education and socialization, socialization provided in the orphanages. They also tell of terrible cruelty at the hands of administrators and teachers and the generally precarious nature of refugee orphanhood. The life stories of Panian, Ivakian, and Zaruchian are somewhat out of the ordinary in that they document the lives of young people who became quite successful in adulthood, but they are far from unique. Of the three, Ivakian had the most contact with Americans and American institutions throughout her life, and indeed she is an example of the real impact of the exceptionalism of Near East Release Project. Instead of making new Near Easterners, Near East Relief had helped make new Americans in the Middle East, or at least Armenians who were both modern but still quote-unquote out of place in the societies where they found refuge. Though Avakian did not emigrate, thousands of others in situations similar to hers found assimilation in Arab Syria and Lebanon untenable, and their transition to Western society was smoothed by their education and training at the hands of Near East Relief. Zaruchian and Panian remained in Beirut too, wrote exclusively in Armenian, and became part of the cultural revival of what was an autonomous, or perhaps more correctly ghettoized, Armenian community in the logic of the consociational regime of independent Lebanon. Avakian was from the village of Korpe in south central Anatolia. Upon her father's death in the years before the outbreak of World War I, she was sent as a half orphan. Her mother, of course, still lived to live at a German missionary orphanage in Kharpet, where she remained until her mother remarried. She was briefly reunited with her mother and abusive stepfather. Her mother returned her to the orphanage as war began, and in all likelihood perished, along with most of the Armenians of the Kharpet district. Young Avakian survived the genocide in the orphanage, but was witness to terrible atrocities between 1915 and 1919, including the mass execution of male deportees. With the end of the war, Near East Relief took control of her orphanage from the German nuns who had run it for a quarter century. In 1922, Avakian was evacuated to the new Near East Relief Orphanage in the seaside Beirut suburb of Antilias. She had little contact with Near East Relief American relief workers, whom she invariably and inaccurately called Near East Relief missionaries. Armenian writers at the time had no word for relief workers. Mm -hmm. Until she was selected to participate in a pilot nurse education program that was run by the American faculty of the hospital 
of the American University in Beirut. And this is her writing. In 1923, several months after my arrival at the orphanage in Antilias, two missionaries from American University Hospital arrived to select some girls to be taken to Beirut and trained as nurses. Several of us were called to the superintendent's office and lined up for inspections. I was wearing a long, dark, shabby dress, and my hair was done in pigtails tied with red ribbon. The kind, smiling eyes of Mrs. Graham and Miss Ella Osborne, the two missionaries, studied us carefully. The administrator spoke in my favor and was over-generous in her praise of my conscientiousness, willingness, and helpfulness. She spoke highly of my intelligence and a few other virtues which she had seen in me. With her help, I was chosen as one of the four who were to be taken for training. We blushed modestly and went to pack our belongings. We did not possess a great deal, so this operation took but little time. I remember packing my twelve brightly dressed dolls, which she had made herself, and my Bible. These were my only possessions. Fifteen years old at the time, Avakian spoke little English, but quickly adapted. In 1926, Bayard Dodge, who had become the university's president, handed her a nursing diploma. Experiencing feelings that must have been common among successful orphans, a profound sense of survivor's guilt engulfed her in that moment. She writes, Why had mother pushed me into this position? Why hadn't I been allowed to perish with the rest of my family? And now alone, having to face the unknown, was her sacrifice worthwhile. Within two years, she was made head nurse of one of the hospital's floors. Her nursing and nurse educator career would last well into the 1970s. Panion's memoirs, which you should buy and read, tell of a comfortable childhood in Gurun, or in Armenian Gurun, a small town near Sivas in central Anatolia, where his extended family owned orchards and his father and grandfather worked in home building and construction. His father was drafted into the Ottoman army and never seen again and the family was deported by foot in 1915 to a concentration camp near Hama in central Syria. There, most of the family perished, and young Panyan was put in the care of a German orphanage. He was transferred by the Ottoman military authorities to a state-administered <coughs> orphanage near Beirut at Antura in 1917. As, this, as I talk about in the next chapter, that orphanage was the site of an experiment by a member of the young Turk elite, Halide Adip Adivar, to quote-unquote Turkify young Armenians and Kurds through abusive practices and the erasure of social identity. Panion survived that orphanage and after the war was transferred to the care of Near East Relief. Panion was among the first group of orphans dispatched from the Levant to Aintep as part of Near East Relief's resettlement project in Cilicia. He recalls at that moment the restorative nature of their return, not necessarily home but to a new Armenian enclave under American humanitarian <coughs> protection. Obviously, in Aintep, our education and our nutrition were equally important to the orphanage's administration. We ate three meals a day, every day, and the food was always plenty to satisfy us, as was the bread. We now also had the chance to take a bath with hot water once a week, and we very much appreciated this new privilege. In Antura, the orphans had bathed perhaps four times in four years. So, my kids would do that by choice. Some of the boys had even forgotten how to wash themselves. Our Turkish caretakers had completely neglected to teach us basic hygiene. Soon we began making real progress. We could read, we could write, and our vocabulary was becoming prolific. Even out in the courtyard during recess, we often read aloud to each other, Though we were not allowed to sing aloud, we were in a Turkish neighborhood, after all, and hearing Armenian children singing happily just may irritate the locals. Near East Relief's ultimate plan was to continue to train and educate the young people as the basis of a revitalized community that was now largely without the white-collar professionals and artisans who had been exterminated during the genocide. The education Panyan received empowered him to see himself in that kind of social role, Quote, I could read fluently, unquote, he remembered after a year at the Eintep facility. And I had read my textbook, cover to cover. I had learned some of the stories within it by heart, and often entertained my friends by reciting them. They were amazed at my ability to absorb and retain information. And I remember one day one of them looked at me and prophetically said, 
Just you wait. You'll be a teacher someday. And of course he was. This was a fresh new idea, and I molded over for quite some time. I let my imagination run free, and I wondered whether I could really could one day become a teacher. These reflections kept me busy for many days. Nonetheless, the fighting which had convulsed Maharaj in 1920 soon reached Aintep as well. The young people were brought into the old Armenian quarter, which the Americans believed could be more easily defended during communal violence. The Near East relief efforts in Aintep were led by Ray Travis, 1906 to 1965, whom Panyan remembered fondly as a great giant of a man who enjoyed eating and playing with the orphans. In a departure from the nonviolent actions Kurd took in the face of communal violence, when the Armenian district in Aintep was attacked by armed Turkish irregulars, according to Panyan, and I have to tell you, no other source, Travis took up arms himself, firing on the attackers and securing weapons and ammunition from the French colonial forces for the Armenian fighters. The fighting took the life of one of the orphans, Manouk, who died from a bullet wound. With the French total withdrawal from Cilicia, Panyan, Ray Travis, and the others were evacuated back to Lebanon, and Panyan was placed with 300 others in a Near East relief facility in the town of Jbeir. Reflecting on the failure of the return to Aintab, Panyan recalled, I remember standing in the twilight near those ruins and thinking, nor was I the only one to have these thoughts, that we had come to a new country and we would have to start from scratch again. But at least here we knew that we would have everything necessary to survive. We also knew we would receive the best possible education. We would now have to work as hard as possible to rebuild our shattered lives." Unquote. Panya would continue his education and go on to be a beloved teacher at Beirut's Jamaran, <coughs> the premier Armenian language high school in the Levant. In Panyan's story, with its recurring emphasis on the role Near East Relief played in Armenian education, the organization's contribution to preserving Armenians as a people comes through. Education was more than just a pragmatic effort, but was seen as a central element to the restoration of the humanity of the survivors by reattaching them to their community's language, culture, and history. That emphasis is one of the most unique elements of the entire Near East Relief Project in the region, and definitive of its place in the formation of the Armenian diaspora. Zaruchian was also from Burin, and only two years old when he was deported with his mother, Yoranuhi. His father, Toros, had joined a resistance movement, but had been captured and executed in Marash. The mother and son survived a period in the Syrian desert and were interned at a camp near Aleppo. With war's end, Zaruhian's mother, whose job as a cleaning woman at the city's famous Baron Hotel, left her in a precarious existence, could not care for him, and placed him, again as a half-orphan, in the Armenian Protestant Orphanage, which at the time was a converted enormous courtyard home in one of the city's walled neighborhoods. Zaruhian was later transferred to the Near East Relief Facility at Jebel. Returning to Aleppo in 1920, he was eventually reunited with his mother and then sent to Beirut's Jemran on scholarship. Zaruhian's memoir, which he wrote later in life after a career as an author, poet, and journalist, describes Dickensian conditions at the orphanages. Perpetual hunger, lack of blankets and clothes, corrupt caretakers, abusive treatment, and occasional moments of laughter and humor. Zaruhian had a deep sense of how orphan life had damaged him and those around him. It is a profound reminder of how the dehumanizing and debasing elements of genocide continue to be visited on survivors, no matter how effective programs of relief could be. Quote, he writes, We weren't just orphans. We never wore the orphan's mask of sorrow and desolation because we never felt the absence of goodness or affection. Ours was one collective face, rude, <coughs> bitter, mischievous. We hated everyone. We hated each other. Every manner of lie was our defense. It was natural law to beat up the weak, to be beaten by the strong. For a piece of bread the size of a fist we battled, bit, bled. Love was an incomprehensible word, friendship, an unknown feeling. Bread was comrade, friend, and love. Unlike Avakian and Panyan, both of whom became almost ideal products of Near East Release efforts, Zoruchian had only a brief and sporadic experience with American modern humanitarianism. 
Most of his education was at the hands of Armenian Protestants. Indeed, it is hard to imagine with his description of the poor education they were receiving in the orphanage that he would have had the literary career he did had he not been returned to the care of his mother and enrolled elsewhere. Zaruchian did have one very significant encounter with Near East Relief, and I'll conclude with the story. A Christmas gathering in honor of an Armenian intellectual, the Istanbul-based satirist Yervant Odion. Odion, whose own encounter with humanitarian disaster and rescue is discussed in, in I talk about it later in my book, was inspecting Aleppo's orphanages and distributing presents after visiting the killing fields near Deir Azor, where he himself had once been exiled. He arri his arrival was greatly anticipated by the boys in the orphanage who had learned of his reputation as a humorist and expected that he was coming to entertain them. Zaruchian was ushered into an assembly at the orphanage where Odion, two unknown female representatives from Near East Relief, and the administrators of the facility were arrayed on stage. The director introduced Odion with great flourish which Zaruchian and his friends, around seven years old at the time, little understood. After the introductions, the director asked Odion to say a few words. We, we waited for him to speak, Zaruchian recalls, to laugh, to make us laugh. One word would have been enough to set us roaring. After a long, awkward interval, he opened his mouth. Children, orphans, he went silent again and tried to return to his seat, but the director stopped him. The guest tried once more to speak, this time a little louder. Orphans, I love you very much. He didn't say another word. He returned to his seat, dabbing his eyes with a handkerchief. As important as the refugee children and orphans were to the American project in the Middle East, the Vorper, as orphans were called in Armenian, meant much more to what was left of the Istanbul-based Armenian elite, like Odeon. And seeing them there in an American orphanage, safe, or at least safer, in French-occupied Syria, was a relief. But it also must have been a reminder of the loss of humanity that had produced this army of parentless boys. Boys Odeon knew were so deeply scarred that they would have no childhood, and then only the slimmest chance at a normal life as adults. The intense sorrow and anguish of being an adult, powerless in the face of the pain and trauma of children he had been unable to protect during the war, and now to whom he could only provide the most modest of assistance, must have placed an almost unbearable burden on Odeon, a burden that it would have been familiar to Stanley Kerr. With that burden in mind, it is hard to imagine that Near East Relief's Americans in the field those who knew in detail the suffering these children had endured during the genocide, and then witnessed those same children facing renewed ethnic violence and displacement, would have found themselves imagining them as mere instruments of a quasi-colonial American political project in the new Near East. Odeon stared at the floor of the stage and never looked up. The director quickly summoned a beautiful older teen known to the boys as Miss Zabel to Miss Zabel. The boys believed that she would soon travel to America as a mail-order bride. Without accompaniment and in the mournful tones of the tetrachordal scale, she sang, Barzir Akhpur, run pure, O spring. Run pure, O spring, so I can take water to the curd sun. Run pure, O spring, so I can give water to the bay's sun. Spring, do you know what the curd does to us? He robs us. He hunts us down. He murders us. There was a time when we lived free. We roamed mountains and plains free and without fear. Spring. Our world is now cloaked in black. Oppression. Oppression. Massacre. Terror and darkness. The children looked up in stunned silence. Then, as the adults, even the American women, wept, they too began to cry. Thank you.
catches his breath for a moment. Uh, I want to, of course, point out that Bread from Stones you can purchase <coughs> tonight. <coughs> and I know Keith would be very happy to sign copies, and I think he'd be even happier to sign copies as soon after the talk breaks up as possible because he has to be shuttled to Worcester this evening so that he can be on duty tomorrow. Uh, I was telling Keith earlier that uh, back in 1971, Stanley Kerr spoke, not in this building, alas, but uh, to, uh, to a NASA audience at uh, the 15th, 16th, 17th, I don't know exactly what number, annual assembly of NASA. And we have a recording of that uh, talk by Stanley Kerr. And uh, I, will, I will get that put up online as, as soon as possible. So to, to have had Stanley Kerr speak, and to have Keith speak, and to have Asya here, and so many other uh, wonderful uh, friends and scholars of multiple generations here in the room, I'm thinking of, of connections, as, as Sarah was saying before, is very meaningful and, and really very nice to stand up here and, and look out over. Um, do you have any questions? Why don't you supposed to ask the first question? Oh, I, don't, I only ask the first question if no one else uh, oh, okay. comes up with a good one. Okay. So, uh, yeah. don't put me on the spot. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I'll <coughs> Did the did, did Near East Relief help other minorities yes. in the yeah, Middle yes. East as well? Yes. So, in fact, they also helped Turks in the, you know, the Mabel Elliott, whose mm -hmm. memoir I, I referenced in the book, you know, ran the Near East Relief Run hospitals, and they didn't turn anyone away. Um, I mean, one of the charges that's often made by the Turkish government and you know, denialists and so on is that you know the Americans only cared about the Armenians; they right. weren't helping. And I think that's a very interesting criticism. I think I was going to ask Asya about this. So I don't know if I want to. I, no, do you, can I? Do you want me to keep talking? Okay. Okay. Well, here, here's the interesting thing, right? Is that, and this, this actually, Mark, when I published some of this earlier work, and after I'd seen you, I went back to Davis, uh, my university's uh, alumni magazine really liked this article I'd written, so they wrote an article about it. And then we got attacked by the Assembly of Turkish American Associations, of course, for doing this. And one of the attacks was that, um, you know, why are, you know, how can you say this is universal humanitarianism? It was only for Armenians. And the argument that, that we, I think, makes the most sense to try to explain this, I mean, I think you cannot ignore the fact that, you know, Americans brought with them certain prejudices about Islam, and, and they had a long relationship with Armenians through missionary work and so on. But here's the thing. Muslim citizens of the Ottoman Empire, those who remained in Anatolia, had a state that was there to protect them and their interests. Those who faced genocide had been functionally denationalized by the end of the First World War, and legally denationalized just a few years later. They didn't have a state. And so one of the important contributions I try to make in this work is to explain how humanitarianism can function like a state for refugee populations. So Near East Relief was caught in this terrible position. There was, there was no UN High Commission for Refugees yet. You know, there would be the League of Nations Nansen Commission later. There was the French colonial government, which was fighting wars on all sorts of fronts. There was the new Kemalist government that did, that, that did not want the Armenians back and were denying them their basic rights. So the Armenians are stuck in the middle. There's, there's no one protecting them or their rights or so on. So Near East Philippe rightly assessed the situation of who had the most need and helped the Armenians. It's as simple as that. And so the idea is that, you know, as imperfect as it might have been, Muslim citizens of the what was the Ottoman Empire Turks and other other ethnic groups had a state. You know, and, and, and you had the brief moment where there was Armenia, but you know that disappeared very quickly as well. So this notion of statelessness is really important, I think, in this. Yeah, so but that's yeah. But that's that doesn't really that's not your first question. This is another <laughs> part of that answer. But you often hear this. You know, he's like, you know, Watt and Paul wrote this book about nearest relief, and, you know, he doesn't talk about how terrible the war was on Turks. I, I read my book. I talk about that in detail, in fact, but that's okay. Right, Asya? 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> See, we only get this is like a hazing ritual for <laughs> baby doctors, right? Is that we, you know, and, and at this point it's over, right? We don't get to ever do this again to you. So you have to pass through this like hazing, and then we let you go. <laughs> you do wonderful work. Go ahead. It's been about 20 years since I read Beginning Again at Ararat, the uh -huh. Mabel, Mabel Evelyn Elliott memoir. Right. And I vaguely recall she tells these very interesting stories about how she handled the Turkish soldiers. Mm -hmm. And I got a sense that she felt she had an advantage being a woman and that she could seem helpless when she wasn't. Yeah. And she preyed upon, you know, their sense of chivalry to right. get her way. But do you remember some of those incidents? Um, I do, I do. But I think, you know, can I tell you my preferred Mabel Evelyn Elliott story? Yes, yes. Okay. And I, I think about this, because I visited Madash with Adrian, and I and I had read her memoir, and I read Kerr, and I read the Diplomatic Dispatches. And the thing that always struck in my mind is that midwinter flight. They had to leave Madash in the middle of the night, under fire, there was snow on the ground. <coughs> Right, and I'm from California. I just do not like snow. <laughs> so, and it wa wasn't until I stood in the Madash Citadel and I looked out over that plain towards where I knew the train station of Islahia was, right, which is where the they got on the train, the Berlin Baghdad train, and I saw how desolate and flat and windswept and long it was that I understood the terror of that evening. And then I understood something very interesting about, about Mabel, because she went with them that night. And she walked, and the French were willing to let her ride in the car, she said, no, I'm going to walk. And she walked with them. And she has her own horror that evening, because what happened was the evacuating women from Madash put their kids on their backs. And, uh, you know, you, know this, the, you see the pictures of the old ladies, right, with their kids on their back. And every mother who did that, that child died from hypothermia. Oh. And Mabel, Mabel was the one who would have to go up to the moms who'd be trudging along with the dead child on their back and ask and tell them it was over. And just put the child down in the snow, on the plane. The only kids who survived were the ones who walked. Mabel walked. And at the end of that journey, she, she reflects on what it might be to be a refugee. She says, now I'm a refugee. Then she corrects herself, but I can go home anytime I want. And I could just, you know, go get on a steamer out of Beirut. I'd be back in Benton Harbor, Michigan, in a week and a half. Right? But that story always stuck with me, because I've always considered that one of the best things an American has ever written about being a refugee during the First World War. Ever. Ever. You know, people always, you know, Dismiss Mabel as a, you know, paternalistic, but she was actually I think a very interesting, very thoughtful woman, and that's that one moment that book crystallizes after me, that moment of incredible reflection that I've never seen in any other of these Western relief memoirs, right? Um, and she was very good friends with Dr. Dirk Zadian, who was the, the great chronicler of Madash and Zaytun and so on too. In that period. I mean, she she's a very interesting character. So, other questions. Oh, sorry, I'll use my lecture voice. Back here. Um, well, I have a question. Um, I've been doing some family research and pastoral research, and I'm um, really interested in an area of Harput and the You know, there's a lot of missionary work mm -hmm. prior to the masters, um, particularly because I know that my family mansion, what they call the mansion, was, um, became a school in the mansion. It's written up in those people. But I haven't figured out yet if, um, I know there was rent paid for the building to the two surviving women um, for this, which two would have 250 Was this after the war? Or was it after during the war? After 1915. Yeah. Well, well. Trying to figure out, was it Neary's relief? Well, here's the Karpertsi. You know. <laughs> Neary's Relief, Neary, right, right. Neary's right. Relief had facilities in, in Kharkiv, right. and it, it had a facility there. After the war. After the war, though. I don't know quite when she's, you're thinking now, about this it. No, this was interesting. No, I know because, for one thing, there was a woman, a local woman, who, who attended the school, and she had been negative and she worked with the book 
There was also, through a lot of these, I mean, Carpert had a big American Protestant missionary presence. Other places had a big German, you know, Lutheran presence, or yeah. the Kaiser Verz sisters yeah. or something, right? So, you know, I think you'd have to ask someone more familiar with the microhistory of Carpert. Like yeah. Barbara Margarian. Yeah, yeah. someone like that. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense to me. Good. Barbara, do you know? What's she saying? I don't know. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. I just want to thank you for talking about Marash because my family is from there. My sure. grandmother was in the orphanage, yeah. the Bethel orphanage with the lady my near Bethel. Was there too. Her, her, yeah. her is named after that orphanage, and my grandmother was also in uh, right. Aleppo orphanage. So right. I mean, I you, you should really personal. read Kerr's Lines of Marash. Lines of Marash. Yeah. Yeah. There's right. copies for sale out here. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I, I remember my, we, we tried to find the Near East Relief compounds up above. Mm -hmm. Marash this last time we were here, we had Turkish speakers with us and everything. We go up, and it's in a military compound. Where the girls' college was? Yes, is it? yes up on the yeah. towards the top of the hill. And they, they said, even if you got an order from the general staff, we wouldn't let you in. <laughs> okay. Wow. So we, we, we couldn't find it. But I, I took Kerr's map with me, and I stood up on the top of the citadel, and I held the map out, and I just tried to, it's all gone. It was quite a walk from Marash to that railroad, Islahe. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's a hundred yeah, yeah. it's a hundred kilometers. Oh really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. I we, thought we it was drove six it. Or we drove miles. we got to drive it last time I was there. We didn't have to walk it. And my it grandmother is, walked there yep, with yeah. Mabel Elliott. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she was a heroine in Mabel Elliott. Yeah. Doctor Elliott. Adrian. Well, first of all, thank you so much. Um, I do a lot of work consulting with humanitarian organizations and it's such a wonderful thing to have someone reflect on what it means to do humanitarian work because a lot of times humanitarians are just trying to provide beds and blankets and water and medicine and they don't have a lot of um, time to really think deeply about what they're doing and I guess my question is given the intense humanitarian crisis that's reshaping the Middle East and Europe as we speak and arguably our world what um, what lessons do you see, and I realize that this is sort of the... Uh, I'm a historian, I'm not supposed to do that. Uh, well, I know, but I'm just asking your opinion. Um, no, but do you see themes that are meaningful? I mean, you talked about the state and that, that the, state, the importance of the statelessness. You know, people have written about the fact that UNHCR is a kind of uh, surrogate state, and mm -hmm. it's rapidly becoming a bankrupt one. Well, that, this is what I've been, I mean, look, there's, there's 65 million refugees in the world today, there's another 29 million internally displaced. We're, we're reaching a point where between 1 and 2 percent of all humanity is going to be a refugee or displaced in some form or another, probably by 2022 or 2025. And so we're just ill-equipped as a, as a species to deal with this. I mean, we're not, you know, we're we're taking money away from refugees entering Denmark to, <laughs> to let them in. Um, so, you know, we, we really don't have it. And I think that, that any time we sort of think historically or reflect on the past of humanitarianism, we can do it. It's just, it's understanding why we have to do it is also another critical thing. And it's more than just the pragmatism of it. What worries me is we, we do lose part of what makes us human when we fail to address the suffering of the most needful, or the most needy. It's just what, you know, that, that you know, it's the, the better angels of our nature to, to do this. And, you know, Armenians have, the Armenians that live today, their ancestors survived it. And in part they survived it because people half a world away gave a damn and helped them. Um, so I'm always happy to see, you know, Near East... Foundation has gotten, has really rebounded as an organization. They've gotten more involved in Syrian refugee relief. Um, you know, and I think about, you know, it's, there's, there's ample opportunities to, to act now. So, the need is immense. It's, it's actually, it's a well with no bottom as far as I can tell right now. Um, 
and I, I wonder what a world where two percent, one to two percent of everyone on this planet is displaced will look like. I mean, what kind of world will that be like? You know, I mean, you know, look at the political crises in rich Europe over not very many refugees, and multiply that, and you'll see democracy itself begin to crumble out of fear of of these refugee populations. You just have to pull a wall up around America. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep them out. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> well, uh, I would like to ask a really meaningful and okay. thought-provoking question, yeah, but I don't yeah. have one. So <laughs> what I would like to say instead is just thank you for being here and uh, for all the work you're doing Thanks. in your writing and in your uh, advising of uh, our next generation of scholars. And, um, you know, it's you my don't, pleasure. And you I don't have think... to wait five or six years. No, I'll, I'll try to come back sooner this next time. <laughs> so, all right, thanks. thanks. Please buy a book. <laughs> have some snacks, have some thing to drink. I and think uh, you we worked out all the proceeds go to the is that right? What for all the proceeds? From my book. All the proceeds everywhere? No, no. From the sales team. Yes. Yeah, yeah, tell them. Tell them. I know that. Yeah. No, just tell them. All the proceeds go to Nasser. They're not lining the pockets of Keith David Wattenbach, I'll tell you that. <laughs> they are not. Third. <laughs> Bethel, that's something, huh?